I learned a lot of things that I perhaps never would have learned, or it would have taken me years and years to have learned what I learned there in a very short time. You see, that was an intense cauldron of ideas, of controversy in that day and time. In decades following his brief enrollment at Commonwealth College, Orville Eugene Faubus would attain political success as a six-term Democratic governor of the state of Arkansas, but his controversial gubernatorial career was almost derailed before it started when in 1954 he would be accused of communist ties by incumbent governor Francis Cherry during the height of the 1950s Red Scare during the McCarthy era. People panicked. My headquarters uh, was empty. And uh, people were calling, some were crying, some were concerned, some were fleeing away placing distance between me and them. I said, I'm not going tonight. And I told them what, I was going to, what my story was going to be, that I did go to the college. I was there for a time. I was elected president of the student body. But I left shortly afterward. Anyhow, I for somewhat brief stay before the semester was over and went back home. Faubus managed to weather the storm and win the election that fall. However, controversy would continue to plague his political career when in 1957, Faubus, in defiance of the U.S. Supreme Court, tried unsuccessfully to block the integration of Little Rock public schools. The national notoriety would forever label him as a segregationist, an ironic postscript in the life of arguably Commonwealth College's most successful alum. Faubus made a calculated decision in 1957, and it was a bad decision. And he complicated it through the years since then by never apologizing, by never admitting his mistake. You know, George Wallace did, and George Wallace was rehabilitated. He's not George Wallace, and, and uh, did not particularly demagogue the issue. But you would have wanted to think that they would have produced a great leader who would have taken on the challenge rather than surrendering to the dangers involved in it. Although the issue of segregation was never confronted by Commonwealth College, the new activism under Lucian Koch put the nation's youngest college president and many of his students at the dangerous forefront of attempts to organize tenant farmers in the Mississippi Delta of eastern Arkansas. Commonwealth could not resist the lure of organizational activities of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. It was for the college a fatal attraction. Union leaders such as H.L. Mitchell were determined to avoid the red taint so closely associated with the school. Nonetheless, the shared political and social goals of the college and the STFU led both to forge a brief and at times acrimonious alliance. Initially, Commonwealth provided training for potential union leaders drawn from tenant members of the STFU. However, by 1936, the relationship between school and union had soured to the point that the STFU and its national supporters demanded a total reorganization of the college. Commonwealth accepted the ultimatum, but the winds of change at the campus quickly turned into a raging tempest when the college announced its selection of radical Presbyterian minister Claude Williams as executive director. I never really met Claude Williams, but uh, I, I, know, I know my bad dad would get angry even t talking about him. Williams, you see, appears as a more Machiavellian figure. That raises with him the issue of trust. And of course, that's, that's why H.L. Uh, Mitchell at the Southern Tenant Farmers Union came to the conclusion you couldn't trust him because he was actually carrying out an agenda uh, and was not being open uh, and forthright with, with people, uh, but uh, manipulative. STFU leaders were terrified of Williams' alleged communist sympathies, and the union's fears about Williams and the college suddenly seemed justified in August 1938 when a document surfaced that purported to be a detailed plan by the communists at Commonwealth to capture the Union for the party. The scheme apparently had Williams' approval. A shaken Union president, J.R. Butler, led the STFU move to disengage completely from the college and Williams. By the end of the year, it was done. 
and Commonwealth had lost its reason for being and all of its moderate leftist support. The estrangement from organized labor, shattered finances, and organized local opposition led by Baptist Minister L.D. Summers dictated drastic action. Rejecting proposals to close or merge with Highlander Folk School at Mont Eagle, Tennessee, the Commonwealth College Association decided to soldier on and to make the school a drama center under the auspices of the radical New Theater League of New York City. This was too much for local residents, and charges of anarchy, failure to fly the American flag during school hours, and displaying the hammer and sickle emblem of the Soviet Union were filed against the school in Polk County Court in Arkansas. The hammer and sickle symbol that was that Lucian and that group put in the well house. Uh, they came up with a story that that was just by accident. The tools just fell in the cement. <laughs> and you could tell by the look at that photograph there was no accident to it. So they did try to downplay that part of it. The college was found guilty and fined a total of $2,500, which it could not pay. Appeals were fruitless in all of Commonwealth's property real and otherwise, was sold to pay the fine. By the end of 1940, Commonwealth College had ceased to exist. Well, I think, I think the only thing you can say there was that uh, it had made itself a, a sitting duck and there was political capital to, to be made. There was local opposition, not like the locals were there to uh, save our little school. Uh, and uh, there were problems with the ethics and morality and honesty of the leadership. I think it was doomed from the beginning because of the economics of the thing. Eventually you run out of faculty who's willing to volunteer and you're going to run through those people and eventually these people need to make a living. I think locating Commonwealth in, in the Washita Mountains at Mena, Arkansas in the 1920s it was a doomed enterprise. It, it, there was just such a cultural gap between the Commonwealth people and the local people that there was no way it could uh, survive. I don't see how it could have survived over the long haul. Uh, certainly the coming of the New Deal would have been a difficult thing for them to deal with. It took much of a sail out of their wings because the federal government itself all of a sudden was providing food and other forms of relief for people. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't nearly the, the radical change, the revolutionary change, the, the cooperative commune that the commoners envisioned. Uh, uh, Roosevelt horrified, in fact, Republicans are still running against Franklin Roosevelt, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, they would have thrown themselves off buildings if the commoners' ideas had prevailed. Radicalism has always had a place in Arkansas life, sometimes in some very unexpected places, and uh, that, that school is one example of it. And what's amazing is how much you can find from the founding fathers uh, who argued that we have given you a chance, but it's up to you and it's up to every single generation uh, to fight and keep it. And it is from these groups which are frequently in, in their own time and in their own period seen as completely outside the norms uh, who will often define what the norms are going to be in decades to come. And so the controversies continue and, and Commonwealth as an issue is alive as it once was as an institution.